Hey there, my name is AJ Yan, and, and welcome to a demo from the part one series that I conducted titled Why You Need Automation to Achieve Compliance in the Cloud. Now, this demo was supposed to be a part of the original webinar series, uh, but unfortunately, I had some travel issues, so I wasn't able to be in front of all of the equipment I normally use. So we took this time to record this demo for all of the attendees that did tune in. Now, just as a quick reminder, as we, as we get in here to the demo, this session is a part of a three-part series to bring attention to SEC 557, Continuous Automation for Enterprise and Cloud Compliance. The SANS course that I am currently an associate instructor on uh, and teaching right now. Now, again, as I mentioned, this is a part of a three-part series. The first part was why you need automation to achieve compliance in the cloud. On August 10th, I'll be conducting a webinar leveraging OS query for compliance, a recovering auditor's perspective. I'm extremely excited about that one. I will be right here in front of my equipment for a heavy demo-led webinar to dive into all of the different ways we can use OS query in our environments from a compliance perspective. Now, in this session that we had uh, on July 27th, we talked about why we need automation in the cloud, our philosophy for automating compliance at SEC 557. We went over a patch management example to show some of the depth that we get into uh, in SEC 557, as well as from an automation perspective. And the plan was to conduct this brief demo. So just as a reminder, we're gonna hop into a couple quick definitions that are important for you to think of as we're going into this uh, demo. One is around patch age, which is simply the number of days since the last patch was applied. And then patch velocity, which tells you how many patches were applied per day. And, and those and definitions are important to remember uh, as we get into the demo here. So one of the great things that I've learned um, from SEC 57, just being an instructor, as well as uh, participating in the class at first as a student, is it follows a similar method of how I learned things in the military. In the military, we, if using land navigation as an example, we were taught with a compass and a map. We, we learned the manual way of how to navigate. Even though you know GPS exists and you know there's technology out there that can help you, it's important to learn the basics when maybe technology fails you or you need to really understand at the depth, deep level how this stuff works. So we're gonna learn some of the manual ways of, of doing things and walk through some of them here. But during SEC 57, SEC 557, we build a bunch of scripts out to do this at scale. One of the scripts that I talked about in the webinar in part one is a script that we went out and, and retrieved patch age and patch velocity for over a hundred servers in a environment we set up over the course of 12 months. So we were quickly able to gather uh, how often a system was patched, uh, when the last last time they were patched across 100 servers, and display that visually, which is really one of the goals of uh, SEC 557. So the first thing that we're going to grab is patch velocity. And as a reminder, patch velocity is simply a way that we can measure how many patches uh, were installed on a particular date um, when the host was patched. So to measure patch velocity on a Windows system, we're gonna run Git hotfix and we're gonna group it by the installed on property um, and tab complete is failing me um, or I'm failing tab complete, however you wanna look at it. Um, and we're gonna grab this by the installed on property. We'll see what we get back here. So you can see here that on May 11th, we had two patches installed. Uh, and then on January 6th, we had two more patches installed. On July 12th, there was two more patches installed. And then on August 3rd, there was a patch installed. So one thing you can, that immediately probably jumps out on you is on this machine, we went about six months here, or it looks like we had a patch in May. So about four months between, uh, or that's last year. So last year, sorry there, we had, we patched on May 11th, 2020. We didn't patch again until January 6th, 2021. Didn't patch again until July, and then now we patched again uh, in uh, on August 3rd. So this is really interesting to look at. If you were looking at this as one of your machines in your production environment, you'd probably be a little concerned that the patching is not being done on a regular basis. So uh, another thing that we can grab here is going to be patch age. Uh, and patch age is simply the number of days which have elapsed since the last time a patch was installed on the system. 
And obviously, you know, a low patch age does not necessarily mean the system's fully patched, but it does indicate that some patching activity has taken place recently. And, and patch age is also easy to measure. We're simply going to calculate the number of days between today and the latest installed on date returned by Git Hotfix. Now, before we do this, you probably are thinking, hey, AJ, you just showed us that on August 3rd, 2021, and I see on your screen today's August 3rd, 2021, there was a patch installed. So this patch age should probably be zero days, right? Uh, you're, you're accurate, but let's go ahead and just check this out. So what we're gonna do first is create a variable. Uh, and it looks like I've, I've lost my keyboard. There we go, we're back. Create a, a variable to get the newest hotfix. We're gonna sort it by the installed date descending. And then we'll, I'm gonna get the first one that returns using select object. So we'll go ahead and create this variable here. Again, get hotfix. I'm gonna sort it by that installed on property in a descending manner. And then I wanna go out and get, and I forgot a, I spelled get wrong. So I'm gonna to have to go back over there. I wanna get the first one, the last hotfix that was installed. And we're gonna save it all in this variable. Now let me go back and fix that get a hot fix so that we don't get an error here. All right, all right, so now we have that last patch date. And if I called that to see, you know, what does it return? Uh, the last patch date does say it was today, August 3rd, 2021. But let's say we didn't necessarily know when that was. Um, if we wanted to go ahead and get this, we're just gonna calculate the number of days between today and the latest installed on date returned in that last patch date variable. So we're gonna take new time, time span. We're gonna start it at the last patch date, not the last exit code. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, and then we're gonna end it on today using the get date commandlet. And I want the number of days. So there we go. Like we, like we expected, we have zero days since the last patch age. Now, as I mentioned earlier, calculating patch age and patch velocity in this manner is a manual way of doing this directly on the box. But in this class, we use these same commands and commandlets and a few other PowerShell commands to build a script that gets this data across 100 servers and displays it visually in Grafana, uh, as, we, as we saw during the webinar. So let's clear this screen and, and we're going to talk a little bit about the cloud here. Uh, and with PowerShell, uh, when it comes to automating compliance, we talk about using PowerShell because uh, we can live off the land. We can use the tools that our administrators are using and let them administer them. Administer them. Uh, and this is something that we can do here where we can leverage PowerShell to test things like the AWS CIS benchmarks to determine if our AWS accounts are meeting security best practices. Now, again, we're going to look at this in a manual fashion, but during SEC 557, we do a lab that uses Chef Inspect to perform these CIS benchmark tests in an automated fashion and at scale across multiple clouds. We're gonna leverage the AWS PowerShell module here, which is capable of managing and querying many of the services that AWS offers. As you know, if you're in the cloud, there's a lot of services there. And the module contains thousands of commandlets and many of those are Git commands. So. Uh, one note here, kind of some uh, inside baseball, is if you're used to using the AWS CLI, you're going to be very comfortable with these PowerShell commandlets because there's usually a one-to-one -one correlation between the CLI commands and PowerShell commandlets. Now, I, I don't know about you, but this makes it really easy for me to mentally convert from one command type to another. And as I know, just because I've messed around with the CLI a lot, those CLI commands return JSON formatted data, but you can all, you, and obviously we can easily convert those to an object with PowerShell, but the cool thing is the equivalent commandlets do the conversion for you and provide objects for your scripts to consume. So we're gonna go through and, and show you how some of these commandlets work on AWS. And we're gonna focus on a few CIS controls around IAM settings that shows the power of being able to quickly interact with PowerShell objects from your AWS account. So I'm gonna be querying a test AWS account we set up for SEC 557 and go through a few CIS controls here. 
So the first one is going to be this AWS Benchmark Control 1.4, which recommends that we should have no access keys associated with the root account for the organization. So the first thing I'm going to do is just type in this Git IAM account summary. And here I'm going to be able to see there's a bunch of different uh, properties here that I can take a look at. The one that I actually care about here is going to be account access keys present, which is really checking to see if that root account has any access keys present. And luckily, good news here, there are none present. Uh, so we're going to be, and, and if I wanted to do that again, and I just wanted to particularly look at this exact property here, the way that I would do that is just go and say, I want to get I am account summary and just give me this account access keys present property and the value associated with it. And we see there we get the same value of zero. So that's good. We're passing that at first control. Um, now, CIS control 1.5 recommends that the root user should be configured to use multi-factor authentication. So we're going to also check this using the get IAM account summary commandlet. And that is going to then, uh, we're going to go ahead and take this. And we're going to go, if we go back up here, we're looking for account MFA enabled. And you probably saw it up there. It looks like it's not enabled. So this is not good. Uh, we, want, we want MFA to be enabled um, on root account. So that's a control that we're already fell in there. Now CIS benchmark control 1.8 does require a minimum password length of 14 characters for IAM users. And we're gonna go get that information using the get IAM account password policy command list. And now we're going to be able to see all of this different information around max password age, minimum password length, complexity required, um, expiry, allowing users to change their password and such. So this is really valuable information we can get here from this particular account pretty quickly. CIS benchmark control 1.1. Three or 1.13 recommends that each user should have a maximum of one access key available. So you don't want users to have multiple access keys. Uh, so what we're going to do is call that same git, or not the same, but call the git I am access key commandlet. But I want to pipe it through this username that I, or just check specifically for this username that I just created. Uh, to see if this one, if they have more than one access key. And it looks like there's only one access key here. So we're, we're in good shape. And now CIS control 1.515. And I hope as you're looking at this, you're, if you're familiar with PowerShell, you're thinking about all the different ways you can interact with some of this information and do some of this stuff at scale. And we're just going to talk through the basics here of these individual controls, but there's a lot of power that you have here. So we want you to grant permissions through roles. That's what 1.15 talks about rather than directly. Um, so this is you know, a good form of role-based access control to allow you to provision access to a role and not necessarily to a user. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and, and run this get I am user list to check to see uh, what are the users in the account right now? Looks like it's just this 1557 read only user that we just mentioned before. Um, and then we want to check to see uh, the check the list of the user policies against the list of the users to see if there's any policies attached directly. So to do that, we could query each list to see if they're attached to the user returned in that last result. So we could run get these user policies, which it doesn't look like there are any user policies um, attached to this user, um, or it doesn't look like there's any any policies that you can see associated with the user, but there are these three policies attached directly to this um, user right there. Now, manual testing is obviously not gonna cut it and we wanna do things in this automated manner, and especially if there is a list of users that are really long, right? Um, say you have a hundred users in here. So in PowerShell, we can use a for each loop to go ahead and go through each username here and run that same command and get that information at scale. And this is just one way we would do that. So we would run that same get I am user list, run it through a for each loop, um, go through and grab it for every username, get those policies, get those attached user policies. And now my output shows me the processing user string, which I put there, 
what user I'm talking about and which policies are associated with this. So this is just one really quick example of how we can use a some of the power of PowerShell to take information that's returned to us as objects and then interact with it through the PowerShell pipeline and gather information that we, we truly care about. Now, the last CIS control that we'll talk about here, and this is really just to show you that this goes well beyond IAM, um, we need to make sure that CloudTrail is enabled for all regions. So we just run git CloudTrail. And we're going to be able to see a good amount of information associated with CloudTrail here. Is it a multi-region trail? Yes, it is. That's great to see. Um, what's the bucket name where it's stored? Um, is it an organizational trail? Where is it located? All of this good information that you would want to see uh, on CloudTrail. Now, this is just a taste and a flavor kind of of uh, the types of stuff that we do in Sec 557 and the types of uh, exercises that you'll be performing during the during this course. Uh, so definitely looking forward to seeing you all attend part two next week. And then also, if you attend SEC 557, looking forward to diving deeper into some of these commands and seeing things that uh, you can do with some of these commands from a manual fashion, but seeing how you can do it automated and at scale. Thanks for attending and hope to see you and, and chat with you soon.